Hello everyone. Hope you're having a lovely day so far. My name is Juliana in English and Juliana in Español and welcome to the Going Global podcast. Today we're going to be talking with Jessica Clark and Calvin Watry. Jessica is the professor of Joining the Conversation, the Argument of It essay, seminar in the fall, an introduction to social entrepreneurship, and introduction to strategic communication in the spring at LIU Global during the freshman year of instruction. She holds a master's degree from the University of Costa Rica in English literature. Jessica has worked as an advertiser, script writer, and speech writer in the Costa Rican embassy in Washington, D.C. Calvin is currently a freshman pursuing a major in global studies. He is an environmentalist, a cyclist, and will be voting for the first time in the upcoming presidential elections in the U.S. As we know, we've been in the middle of the pandemic for a while now, and the political climate in the States has been especially tense right now. We are a few days from the election, so my first question for both of you is to ask, how are you feeling today about the election that's going to happen next Tuesday? Well, I've already voted. Uh, I did a mail-in ballot. Uh, however, I made sure to like hand in my ballot just because of the current state of the U.S. Uh, Postal Service. Um, just with it being super slow due to pandemic and also uh, other factors. Um, so I have already voted technically. However, I... It was a very interesting experience, especially given the current state of issues in the U.S. Um, I felt like my de decision had already been made four years ago when Trump was elected, um, just because I knew that I had to do something to, um, like, I... For me personally, I know that I wasn't going to vote for Trump and like that was solidified over the four years. So it kind of felt like I had to make less decisions just because um, how it works in the States is basically like each party will follow whatever like their leader of the party is doing. So Republicans would follow in the footsteps of Trump if he was in office and Democrats would follow in the footsteps of Biden if he was in office and that goes down all the way to like city level. So it kind of felt like my ballot was already like predetermined. However, I still had like some freedoms when it came to like choosing positions that you had to select like multiple candidates for. Um, but it was definitely strange just because I didn't feel like I actually had that much of a choice when voting. And that's definitely due to how divided the nation is. I totally get on with the strangeness of the situation. Like, it's funny to me to be talking about the elections in the United States. I have to be clear that um, never before Trump had I been political in my life. And I hadn't been political in Costa Rica, let alone the United States. And even when I was a diplomat in Washington, D.C., it was more about the work than the actual person in the presidency. But the Trump win, and I say we, I put win into quotation marks because uh, the American people actually voted more for Hillary Clinton than Trump, but the Electoral College gave him the win. The win was weird because when he actually became the candidate, um, here, the ones who were observing it were like, yeah, but he's not really going to win. And there was a kind of suicidal part in the back of our heads, like, what if he does? And like, maybe, like, maybe they're going to vote for him just to see what happens. And it's kind of a joke, but it's also kind of like when you're high in a building, you look down and you feel like jumping. But nobody really thought that was going to happen. And the day it happened, the day he actually won, I remember the absolute sense of quietness, of, of like stillness, like something happened that was not normal. It was not just an election where a, a candidate you didn't like won, but something not right had happened. And after that, I started paying attention. And right now, I feel like I'm paying closer attention because over those four years, I realized that what happened in the United States actually affects me personally, and that being political is a necessity. So I learned the hard way and the orange way. 
I agree. I agree. Personally, I also feel like after the Trump election, which is something you both talked about, I've been more invested in politics as well because it was really a game changer. And that is actually a really good segue to talk about how polarized the the United States is right now. So I kind of want to ask you both, how has specifically Trump's presidency affected you? In which ways? And why do you think it has divided the country so much. I haven't really been that affected by most of Trump's policies just because I am a white male. So I, the people that he's trying to benefit are people like me, even though I don't want him to be like championing for me. <laughs> right. um, but um, I guess the most like pertinent uh effect of his presidency would have to be like economically um just because like we have been experiencing like more financial troubles specifically of recently because he's not really pushing for any stimulus aid like my parents have been in a very tricky spot financially due to the pandemic and i'm sure many and many other families are also in the same position. So I guess that would be the most like direct way in which my life has been affected. However, I understand that like other people are way more affected um, by this presidency. And I feel like it's my responsibility to kind of like put myself in their shoes and be like, so if I was one of those people that was being like, their life is in jeopardy pretty much by this president, Uh, what should I do? So, and I think where the discrepancy between people comes in and this division is like this like sense of the individual compared to sense of the collective. And it's like deeply, deeply rooted within the U.S.'s ideologies and identity as a nation, just because it was founded on individual freedoms. So it's kind of like this idea that you don't really need to worry about other people because the goal is to make sure that you have a good life, a good family, economic stability, and so on. I agree with Calvin's uh, idea of the collective in in the way that I've seen um, the Trump presidency affect me. Just before Trump, I had acquired this belief that the United States seems to be everywhere in the world and that maybe they just like butt out and go back home and stop messing with other people. And then when the Trump administration began, things started happening globally. So during the first two weeks of the Trump administration, millions of scientific documents were purged from the internet. And a lot of those documents were documents related to climate change. And um, you would see college uh, professors and scientists from around the world publishing in social media, like we had this article or we had this research published and now it's gone from the internet. And we have like our hard copy in our computers, but it's gone from the popular access. So that was one when I went like, oh, I never saw this coming. I I saw all kinds of, I foresaw all kinds of problems, but it never occurred to me that there was going to be book burning in that sense. And that information has continued to disappear over four years. So imagine the damage that four years of censorship can do and understand that most of the documents on the internet are in English. And then a lot of those documents are produced by scientists that are sponsored or working for American universities or communities. So that information was gone in less than a month. And then they started the United States withdrawing from international programs in Latin America and Africa. And all of a sudden, women whose only access to birth control came from non-government organizations that had backing from the United States, saw themselves out in the wind because Mike Pence is a very religious person, and the United States made this sweeping declaration that they would no longer finance any type of program that provided sex education or contraception to women anywhere in the planet. And the the, the results were apparent almost immediately. And I never thought of that. And then, you know, my idea of the United States should butt out I never understood just how much good influence the United States had in the world. And I started panicking. The next thing that happened was the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. And um, in Costa Rica, we took it kind of personally because it was brokered by Christiana Figueres, 
who is a Costa Rican and a very respected figure here. And we were so proud of our country and we were so proud of her. And then the United States steps back. And the agreement, the United States is so powerful that if they step back, even if the rest of the world signs it, it basically means very little. And all of a sudden, there's no environmental protections that are respected and worth it anywhere. And then there's more personal effects, but those have to do with uh, Costa Rican policy. So I'm not sure that I want to get into that yet. But what I can say is that, as Calvin was saying, I have not personally myself been accosted by angry white people in Costa Rica streets. So I cannot say that Trump affects me personally directly, but he affects me as a human being. And when we talk about Costa Rican policy, I can tell you how else that presidency has affected me. Yes, directly. Do you want to talk about that in a second, too? Because it's I'm still impressed by the fact that the presidency in the States can be so influential in places all around the world, like you just mentioned. But before we get there, I kind of wanted to talk about... Um, the Paris Agreement again, because I feel like it talks about what Calvin was saying between the difference of an individualistic mindset and a collective one, since the Paris Agreement is literally the collective, every single country pledging to make, um, to do climate action around the world. So I just wanted to get your thoughts and your opinions on how can an issue like climate change, which used to be a bipartisan issue years back, it's something that concerns every single one of us, no matter like our politi individual political thoughts, how can that become so politicized? And why do you think um, um, the current administration has had such an, um, a disagreement with it, so much to detract from the Paris Agreement, which is an important part of, of, of the issue? Well, I think one of the things is um, there is a lot of advantage, economic advantage to be had without environmental protections. And the Trump administration's first actions, even you know before um, immigration policy, the first actions were to erase environmental information and neutralize the Environmental Protection Agency. And from then on, only just yesterday, um, I don't know, a, a ridiculous amount of kilometers of wildlife in Alaska that were protected land have been open to exploitation. And imagine just the amount of money that is to be made out of, you know, exploiting resources, which is what humanity has been doing forever. Now we can do it on an industrial scale. The United States can do it in a global scale. And so the first thing is erase the information you were asking, how does it become politicized? Because if you make it relative and you turn it into a belief, do you believe in climate change? Then you can say, no, I don't believe in that and I choose not to believe in it. And if you negate science, everything becomes relative. Every, everything becomes a matter of opinion. It is fantastic to politicize stuff because as long as there's an argument about it, you can still continue to do what you're doing. So the Paris Agreement, marked 25 years of collective planetary action building up towards the understanding that we are all together in the planet. And the United States stepping back is actually uh, an idea of not. We are each of us on our own and it's the survival of the fittest. And it, it was the first time in living memory that the planet was working towards the same goal. So the hit is not only physical to the environment and to the safety and security of the whole planet, but it's also the notion of what it means to be human. Yeah, definitely. I would like to talk uh, a little bit more about withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. Technically, there's uh, like a four-year review period, and that was put in place specifically for like uh, changes in office occurring. So... If re-elected, Trump will be able to like officially remove the U.S. from the agreement. So that hasn't happened yet. However, um, Biden, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't made it one of big campaign promises to reinstate like back into the Paris Agreement. There are things concerning environmental issues. However, I haven't heard much on the Paris Agreement now. That could be one of Biden's plans, and I just haven't heard much about it. However, as 
current voter in the United States not hearing about that. And I'm on like YouTube and social media all day, every day. It's kind of worrying to me. So definitely this idea of individualism and like survival of the fittest, it obviously isn't just a one party thing. I, I think that's just how it is in the U.S. And using uh, resources is also just a part of U.S. culture, even if it isn't in our country. So I, I think that um, in terms of like an environmental point of view, the U.S. is always going to be like somewhat lacking because uh, economic uh, sustainability is way more important to this nation than environmental sustainability. Even though the two can go hand in hand, people don't necessarily want to take that risk of switching over because it is a risk to switch over from one form of economic uh, opportunity to another. You know, I hadn't uh, heard, I, I haven't thought about the fact that Biden and Harris are not talking about the Paris Agreement. Right? And that now I'm more worried. Thank you for that. That's going to be a perfect takeaway from this. But uh, also, let's think about recourse, resources for the rest of the planet. Right before the signing of the Paris Agreement, there was this discussion held by India and China where the United States was leading the conversation and Costa Rica was brokering the whole thing. I'm going to mention Costa Rica as much as I can because, you know, pride. And China and India said to the United States, well, you know, you've already had your industrial revolution. We're only now having ours. So it's very easy for the United States and Europe to say, oh, now we're, going, we're moving to solar. And now we're changing the, produ the modes of production. But for China and India, who are trying really hard to become global powers who have humongous populations that they need to look to and they need to increase production of food and they need to increase everything in order to have a viable economy. Imagine what that's like to come and say, you know, to be told by other people who already have all that infrastructure in place. Okay, now you need to stop doing this and you're not going to be using these fuels. You're going to be using these other fuels. And, and just to bring it back to just how complex the negotiation was and how fragile the balance was that the United States may break, but as Calvin well pointed, uh, I suppose they're still holding and waiting to see what the next president does, whether it's Trump or Biden. Right. No, I agree. I think that's a really good point of just thinking about the culture in the U.S. in general, just thinking about um, how individualism can be a, a bipartisan a trait as well. And I definitely yeah. hadn't thought about that before, which kind of brings me, um, Jessica, to ask you about the impact of this election in Costa Rica, since um, even though the U.S. considers itself very individualistic, it has it impacts on the collective for sure. Yeah. And it's, oh, no. See, I was all happy before all this. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, yeah, the United States, and again, you know, against my will, it, at least for the Western world, the United States becomes a paradigm. And one of the things that we see is we kind of model ourselves, every, every nation that is around, you know, in the influence area, models itself around the United States. And then you would see when we went from Barack Obama, who is very polite and very controlled, to Donald Trump, who's also very angry all the time, that created changes in 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 behavior in world leaders. So when Trump was just a candidate and he was not, not, not a candidate, when he was first elected, but he continued to do rallies and he would point at people in the audience and say, just take him out, take them out, beat him up. And then what happened was, I remember looking, hearing news from uh, um, Eastern Europe and uh, um, places in the Middle East where people got beat up on the streets. And at some point, one of the presidents, I don't remember which country, had some uh, members of the opposition beaten up in the streets. And what he said was, well, if the president of the United States can do it, so can I. And then I have to need to point out that Trump is part of a larger global movement and a larger global picture. Six months before Trump, it was Brexit. And it was the same exact feeling when you think, yeah, it's interesting to think about it, but you really do not want, you know, Britain to live... Uh, the European community, and they did. 
the next day after that vote took place, minorities were harassed on the streets and on public transportation. And so women had their hijabs tore off her heads and people from Italy and from Romania and Poland were yelled at to go back where they came from and just go away. So the second the United States becomes really angry, then that opens the floodgates. And what we saw in Costa Rica was a gradual decline in civility. All of a sudden, our politicians are modeling themselves against American politicians and they're yelling at each other, interrupting each other, calling each other names, going to the press to just ramble, which was not a thing before that. But then very recently, oh, and also remember, when you have all the protests in the United States, you will get people in Europe taken to the streets with flags of Black Lives Matter, but you also have the far right in Europe with flags, with Trump flags. So I haven't seen the flags here in Costa Rica, but in the over the past couple of months, there's been this movement of just taken to the streets and blocking traffic. And there's one particular leader who has been in the, indicted for this before because it's illegal. And what he did less than a month ago was that he called um, quote unquote popular movement and they strategically blocked the streets near the airports and near the ports. And they started burning tires and just yelling. And the whole thing is illegal. And those people would, would come to the protest with sticks to beat on the police. And this new thing about the police is also imported from the United States. And now it's a fight, you know, the rights of the police to beat people up and the rights of the people to beat the police up. And I was really uncomfortable, and most of us were, with the whole thing. But I was only shocked when I realized that some of the leaders are taking the pictures and tagging Melania and Donald Trump on Twitter with their actions and their violent videos. And I went, what is this? How is this happening? And the real problem, and this is where it affects me personally, it is the pandemic. Our economy is tanked, of course. We are not an economy that can survive the way the United States is going to bounce back. And unemployment is at 25%. And we were only coming out of lockdown and opening the doors. And we depend on tourism. And then this happens. And the United States Department of State gives us a four rating out of five in danger, in level of risk. So how does that affect our economy? How does that affect the perception? You know, we live on the notion that we're Pura Vida. And now we get people on the streets burning things. As if that weren't bad enough, these people are now not only not giving up the streets, but they're trying to become recognized by the government. In the middle of, a, of this, because the economy is tanked, our government has to require a loan from the International Monetary Fund, which is already very unpopular because when that happens, the economy is always horrible and there's always an economic recession for 10 years. But because we're a small economy and we have no money, this needs to be done in order to get people not to starve. Because there are people on the street burning tires, the country of Panama gets this loan at a 2.2 interest rate. Costa Rica gets it at 8.3 interest rate. So at, at this point, I'm so angry. I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to have chocolate. <laughs> no, I I agree with you. I am angry too. And it just comes, you touched on so many points there. And it just comes to show that whatever the U.S. U.S.'s philosophies at the moment really impacts and and changes the rest of the world. It has such a big influence that even like I, as you mentioned, the Twitter tagging and the the change of mindset, it, it's just devastating. And it has really it's not only like um, sociological effects, but also real policy effects. Just thinking about that change in interest, comparing it to Panama, just because of the situation that was caused by that changing of thought, which is just devastating. Which, exactly. Yeah. And, and the way we treat each other now and, and the way and a part of me cannot help but think, damn, the United States just went and had an identity crisis and they threw a huge tantrum for some reason and they dragged us all in. Right. But that's just my, uh, you know, emotional reaction. But the fact is, it came, you know, Brexit was the same thing. And it, it unleashed the same kind of rage in Europe. And it's the rise of populist leaders everywhere. And there's a sense that it may not be accidental. But what I can tell you is this. 
now I'm really angry because it's spread out all the way to my tiny country and I thought I was going to be safe here from the emotional violence. But uh, the bigger question is, what is it exactly that broke? Right. Yes. And I think that's something we're all trying to, to figure out what caused this shifted mindset that was so abruptly, right? And yeah. it, it, thinking about like younger generations that inherit this world today and have to live in this world today, it's just, it makes me wonder, like, Calvin, like, how are you feeling with this, with this decline in civility, like Jessica said, like, what what are your hopes for the future? And what, why do you think this is happening? And what do you think needs to be done to make a more empathetic country and world in general? Good question. So um, definitely growing up in this country, uh, it's as if, like, the age of five, I could always remember, like, my dad and mom being, like, my generation speaking from their perspective my generation kind of screwed up the world and it's like up to you to fix it right (laughs) and i think that's a common narrative at least in the u.s i'm sure it is around the world too just like forcing problems onto younger generations because you don't want to deal with them (laughs) that has been going on ever since like such a young age to where um i'm kind of having like a personal identity crisis because it's like I've been forced to think like I need to fix the world and all this pressure has like been built up from my like peers around me thinking similar and also from like teachers throughout high school and administrators and my parents and all that. I can picture, you know, five-year-old Calvin and and Huli and who died and made you save yourself? I mean, (laughs) if we couldn't fix it, how can you take children? And tell them, well, you know, it's very likely that you're not going to have drinking water in 25 years because I took it all. And and now you're going to have to take to the streets and do this. I mean, that's just, imagine the emotional scar on you and you guys. Yeah, it, it's not fun. Definitely not fun. However, I mean, to a certain point, it does work. Like, it got me interested in environmentalism and sustainability and technology, news and all of that. So to a certain point, it worked. However, it definitely wasn't a healthy option. But I think that kind of just goes with how the culture is again. And I think that having this perspective throughout my whole life, I'm currently at a state in where I don't know what I'm going to be uh, wanting to study. Of course. You know, uh, what I want to do in the future, because what does the future look like? And like struggling kind of with that. And I think that is because of not like the pandemic and this notion that like I have to make up for all the failings of like past generations. I remember recalling one of my students a few years back writing a paper that was listing the tragedies. So she what she wrote, but the first thing she remembered was her parents crying on September 11th. And then there was an economic crisis. And then there was the whole climate, we're all going to die thing. And then there was a war. And what she said was that from childhood, her memories were all of loss and above all, a sense of crisis. Like the world is really going to end. Like there's always a reason why, the, not like, you know, end of the world Maya calendar, but end of the world, like the water and the air and the war and the fire. So, uh, yes, I think your generations have seen that. And I think it's been to the detriment of who you are as individuals, because we know that in the future, we're all going to have to be more conscious of, you know, the energy that we use and how we get about and the kind of, if we have a business, it has to be, it, it has to be a more social business. But on the other hand, somehow in the middle of the crisis, I think you guys were robbed of the years where you just... You're just running around thinking, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be a vet. I'm going to be a cowboy. And then you're probably going to have some weird midlife crisis at some point when you're going to go off and try to get a new trade and learn how to knit or something. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> because um, it, all, it got deferred. Yeah, I, I wonder if this like speaks again to like the individuality of the people in the u.s because uh it's like putting your problems onto people that aren't you grants you way more freedom like you don't have to worry about that anymore because now it's someone else's job to like clean up after you so in a way it's more like 
it's both trying to preach collective, like working for the benefit of all of humanity. And also at the same time, it's also talking to like looking out for yourself. It's this weird contradiction that happens and like has been happening. Like my parents also remember their parents telling them the same thing. So (laughs) it's, it's just, it's, kind of crazy to think about like phenomena has just been going on throughout time and the problems just keep on getting worse and worse because no one addresses it i mean some people do and those people are like crazy strong because there has to be a reason why people just push it off to the next people like next generation yeah Um, yeah but but also stuff that have been that i've been noticing lately and one of them is i've always thought that the evil people, it's not that they're more, it's just that they have be- better PR. And you turn on the TV and it's everywhere. The world is ending and everything is on fire. But um, the truth is, two things that I've been thinking. One, I think there was a time where we put everything on the younger generations. Or like, you're going to be do- doing everything. I, I remember especially just the unbelievable amount of faith on in millennials when they were very young. It's like the millennials are coming to save us, and which is totally unfair to the millennials, right? Because they're just people. But what I'm noticing now is all their people changing, all their political leaders actually taking action and doing stuff. And, and it's like a broad spectrum, right? And then science quietly doing things like, this week, almost, almost coming up with a vaccine against Alzheimer's. Imagine that. And, and not crazy people. Calvin and I were talking about Elon Musk earlier. But it's not just crazy billionaires that plan to go to Mars. It's the quiet crowdfunding efforts that are finding close to uh, 11,000 exoplanets right now and new genome mapping techniques. So... The truth is the quality of the air has improved from 100 years and the water is still a problem, but um, medicine has improved. So we only see the crisis. And I think that the crisis benefits some people. This idea that it's hopeless, that everything is awful, that we're all going to live awful. We're going to die awful deaths because of our sins. Uh, I think one thing that I learned about Trump is, oh, my God, who were if Biden is the next president. Can we have four years of quiet and not knowing what the American president is thinking and just go back to being human? Right. And I I so agree with what, what you're saying. Because it is that fact that evil things do have better PR and that's what we're mostly thinking about. So I think that's a really, really good segue to our next topic, which would be like, Regardless of the result of the elections this year, which seem very charged with many feelings of impending doom, what are, oh my God. Yeah, I know. what are your thoughts regarding change that isn't made by policy, that it's like you were saying, Jessica, made by individuals, by humans in their daily lives? Uh, well, I've been thinking before that I'm going to have to add some change that is political, and but I think it's important mm-hmm. in the United States. And it's this, be, because of a combination of international, what would be the word, uh, just international role play and, and spying stuff that has to do with the Russians and, and the Arabs and all that. President Trump came in and he took over the Republican Party. And I think the Republican Party... I do want to talk about that in a second too, because it's, I'm still impressed by the fact that the the presidency in the states can be so influential in places all around the world, like you just mentioned. But before we get there, I kind of wanted to talk about um, the Paris Agreement again, because I feel like it talks about what Calvin was saying between the difference of an individualistic mindset and a collective one, since the Paris Agreement is literally the collective, every single country pledging to make um, to do climate action around the world. So I just wanted to get your thoughts and your opinions on how can an issue like climate change, which used to be a bipartisan issue years back, it's something that concerns every single one of us, no matter like our politi- individual political thoughts, how can that become so politicized? And why do you think um, um, the current administration has had such an um, a disagreement with it so much to detract from the Paris Agreement, which is 
an important part of, of, of the issue. Well, I think one of the things is there is a lot of advantage, economic advantage to be had without environmental protections. And the Trump administration's first actions, even you know before envi- um, immigration policy, the first actions were to erase environmental information and neutralize the Environmental Protection Agency. And from then on, only just yesterday, um, I don't know, a, a ridiculous amount of kilometers of wildlife in Alaska that were protected land have been opened to exploitation. And imagine just the amount of money that is to be made out of, um, you know, exploiting resources, which is what humanity has been doing forever. Now we can do it on an industrial scale. The United States can do it in a global scale. And so the first thing is erase the information. You were asking, how does it become politicized? Because if you make it relative and you turn it into a belief, do you believe in climate change? then you can say, no, I don't believe in that and I choose not to believe in it. And if you negate science, everything becomes relative. Everything becomes a matter of opinion. It is fantastic to politicize stuff because as long as there's an argument about it, you can still continue to do what you're doing. So the the Paris Agreement marked 25 years of collective planetary action building up towards the understanding that we are all together in the planet. And the United States stepping back, it's actually an idea of not. We are each of us on our own and it's the survival of the fittest. And it it was the first time in living memory that the planet was working towards the same goal. So the hit is not only physical to the environment and to the safety and security of the whole planet, but it's also the notion of what it means to be human. Yeah, it, definitely. I would like to talk uh, a little bit more about um, like withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. So um, technically, there's uh, like a four-year review period, and that was put in place specifically for like uh, changes in office occurring. So if re-elected trump will be able to like officially remove uh the us from the agreement so that hasn't happened yet however um biden hasn't uh to my the best of my knowledge hasn't made it one of the like big campaign promises to reinstate like back into the paris agreement there are things concerning environmental issues however I haven't heard much on the Paris Agreement. Now, that could be one of Biden's plans, and I just haven't heard much about it. However, as a current voter in the United States, not hearing about that, and I'm on like YouTube and social media all day, every day, it's kind of worrying to me. So definitely this idea of individualism and like survival of the fittest, it obviously isn't just a one party thing. Um, I, I think that's just how it is in the US. And, uh, and like using uh, resources is also just a part of US culture, even if it isn't in our uh, country. So I think that um, in terms of like an environmental like point of view, uh, the U.S. is always going to be like uh, somewhat lacking because uh, economic uh, sustainability is way more important to this nation than environmental sustainability, even though the two can go hand in hand. But people don't necessarily want to take that risk of switching over because it is a risk to switch over from one form of economic uh, opportunity to another. You know, I hadn't uh, heard, I I haven't thought about the fact that Biden and Harris are not talking about the Paris Agreement and that now I'm more worried. Thank you for that. That's going to be a perfect takeaway from this. But uh, also let's think about resources for the rest of the planet. Right before the signing of the Paris Agreement, there was this discussion held by India and China where the United States was leading the conversation and Costa Rica was brokering the whole thing. I'm going to mention Costa Rica as much as I can because, you know, pride. And 
And, Ch and China and India said to the United States, well, you know, you've already had your industrial revolution. We're only now having ours. So it's very easy for the United States and Europe to say, oh, now we're, going, we're moving to solar. And now we're changing the, the modes of production. But for China and India, who are trying really hard to become global powers, who have humongous populations that they need to look to, and they need to increase production of food, and they need to increase everything in order to have a viable economy, imagine what that's like to come and say, you know, to be told by other people who already have all that infrastructure in place, okay, now you need to stop doing this and you're not going to be using these fuels, you're going to be using these other fuels. And, and just to bring it back to just how complex the negotiation was and how fragile the balance was that the United States may break, but as Calvin well pointed, uh, I suppose they're still holding and waiting to see what the next president does, whether it's Trump or Biden. Right. No, I agree. I think that's a really good point of just thinking about the culture in the U.S. in general, just thinking about um, how individualism can be a, a bipartisan uh, trait as well. And I definitely yeah. hadn't thought about that before, which kind of brings me, um, Jessica, to ask you about the impact of this election in Costa Rica, since um, even though the U.S. considers itself very individualistic, it, it impacts on the collective for sure. Yeah. And there's, oh, no. See, I was all happy before all this. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, yeah, the United States, and again, you know, against my will, it, at least for the Western world, the United States becomes a paradigm. And one of the things that we see is we kind of model ourselves. Every, every nation that is around, you know, in the influence area models itself around the United States. And then you would see when we went from Barack Obama, who is very polite and very controlled, to Donald Trump, who's also very angry all the time, that created changes in behavior in world leaders. So when Trump was just a candidate and he was, no, not, not a candidate, when he was first elected, but he continued to do rallies and he would point at people in the audience and say, just take them out, take them out, beat them up. And then what happened was, I remember looking, at, hearing news from uh, Eastern Europe and uh, places in the Middle East where people got beat up on the streets. And at some point, one of the presidents, I don't remember which country, had some uh, members of the opposition beaten up in the streets. And what he said was, well, if the president of the United States can do it, so can I. And then I have to need to point out that Trump is part of a larger global movement and a larger global picture. Six months before Trump, it was Brexit. And it was the same exact feeling. When you think, yeah, it's inter interesting to think about it, but you really do not want, you know, Britain to leave the United Nations, uh, the European community, and they did. The next day after that vote took place, minorities were harassed on the streets and on public transportation. And so women had their hijabs tore off her heads. And people from Italy and from Romania and Poland were yelled at to go back where they came from and just go away. So the second the United States becomes really angry, then that opens the floodgates. And what we saw in Costa Rica was a gradual decline in civility. All of a sudden, our politicians are modeling themselves against American politicians, and they're yelling at each other, interrupting each other, calling each other names, going to the press to just ramble, which was not a thing before that. But then very recently, oh, and also remember, when you have all the protests in the United States, you will get people in Europe taken to the streets with flags of Black Lives Matter, but you also have the far right in Europe with flags, with Trump flags. So I haven't seen the flags here in Costa Rica, but in the, over the past couple of months, there's been this movement of just taking to the streets and blocking traffic. And there's one particular leader who has been in the, indicted for this before because it's illegal. And what he did less than a month ago was that he called um, quote unquote popular movement and they strategically blocked the streets near the airports and near the ports. And they started burning tires and just yelling. And the whole thing is illegal. And those people would, would come to the protest with sticks to beat on the police. And this new thing about the police is also imported from the United States. 
And now it's a fight, you know, the rights of the police to beat people up and the rights of the people to beat the police up. I was really uncomfortable, and most of us were, with the whole thing. But I was only shocked when I realized that some of the leaders are taking the pictures and tagging Melania and Donald Trump on Twitter with their actions and their violent videos. And I went, what is this? How is this happening? And the real problem, and this is where it affects me personally, it is the pandemic. Our economy is tanked, of course. We are not an economy that can survive the way the United States is going to bounce back. And unemployment is at 25%. And we were only coming out of lockdown and opening the doors. And we depend on tourism. And then this happens. And the United States Department of State gives us a four rating out of five in danger, in level of risk. So how does that affect our economy? How does that affect the perception? You know, we live on the notion that we're pura vida. And now we get people on the streets burning things. As if that weren't bad enough, these people are now not only not giving up the streets, but they're trying to become recognized by the government. In the middle of, a, of this, because the economy is tanked, our government has to require a loan from the International Monetary Fund, which is already very unpopular because when that happens, the economy is always horrible and there's always an economic recession for 10 years. But because we're a small economy and we have no money, this needs to be done in order to get people not to starve. Because there are people on the street burning tires, the country of Panama gets this loan at a 2.2 interest rate. Costa Rica gets it at 8.3 interest rate. So at, at this point, I'm so angry. I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to have chocolate. <laughs> no, I I agree with you. I am angry too. And it just comes, you touched on so many points there. And it just comes to show that whatever the U.S. U.S.'s philosophies at the moment really impacts and and changes the rest of the world. It has such a big influence that even like I, as you mentioned, the Twitter tagging and the the change of mindset, it, it's just devastating. And it has really it's not only like um, sociological effects, but also real policy effects. Just thinking about that change in interest, comparing it to Panama, just because of the situation that was caused by that changing of thought, which is just devastating. Which, exactly. Yeah. And, and the way we treat each other now and, and the way and a part of me cannot help but think the United States just went and had an identity crisis and they threw a huge tantrum for some reason and they dragged us all in. Right. But that's just my, uh, you know, emotional reaction. But the fact is, it came, you know, Brexit was the same thing. And it, it unleashed the same kind of rage in Europe. And it's the rise of populist leaders everywhere. And there's a sense that it may not be accidental. But what I can tell you is this. Now I'm really angry because it's spread out all the way to my tiny country. And I thought I was going to be safe here from the emotional violence. But uh, the bigger question is, what is it exactly that broke? Right. Yes, and I think that's something we're all trying to to figure out what caused this shifted mindset that was so abruptly, right? And yeah, it, it, thinking about like younger generations that inherit this world today and have to live in this world today is just it makes me wonder, like Calvin, like how are you feeling with this with this decline in civility? Like Jessica said, like um, what what are your hopes for the future, and what why do you think this is happening, and what do you think needs to be done to make a more empathetic country and world in general? Big question. Um, <laughs> yeah, no biggie. No, no problem. Uh, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, so um, definitely growing up uh, in this country, uh, it's as if um, like from like the age of five, I could always remember like my dad and mom being like uh, my generation, like speaking from their perspective. Uh, my generation kind of screwed up the world and it's like up to you to fix it, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a common narrative, uh, at least in the U.S. I'm sure it is around the world too. Uh, just like forcing problems onto younger generations because you don't want to deal with them. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, so, I, and that has been going on ever since like such a young age to where um, I'm kind of having like a personal identity crisis because it's like I've been forced to think like I need to fix the world 
And so, and all this pressure has like been built up from like my, uh, like peers around me thinking similar and also from like teachers throughout high school and administrators and my parents and all that. So, and can I just say, can I just say, I can can picture, you know, five-year-old Calvin and, and Huli and who died and made you save yourself? I mean, <laughs> if we couldn't fix it, how can you take children and tell them, well, you know, it's very likely that you're not going to have drinking water in 25 years because I took it all. And, and now you're going to have to take to the streets and do this. I mean, that's just, imagine the emotional scar on you and you guys. Yeah, it, it's not fun. Definitely not fun. However, I mean, to a certain point, it does work. Like, it got me interested in environmentalism and sustainability and uh, technology and news and all of that. So to a certain point, it worked. However, it definitely wasn't a healthy option. But um, I think that kind of just goes with how the culture is, again. Uh, And... I think that um, having this perspective throughout my whole life, like I'm currently at a state in where I don't know what I'm going to be wanting to study. Of course. uh, What I want to do in the future, because what does the future look like? And um, I'm like struggling kind of that. And I think that is because of not like the pandemic Um, and this notion that like, I have to make up for all the failings of like past generations. I remember, Uh, sorry, Kali, I interrupted. (laughs) Go ahead. You're fine. I I remember one of my students a few years back writing a paper that was listing the tragedies. So she was, she wrote, but the first thing she remembered was her parents crying on September 11th. Uh, and then there was an economic crisis. And then there was the whole climate, we're all going to die thing. And then there was a war. And what she said was that from childhood, her memories were all of loss and above all, a sense of crisis. Like the world is really going to end. Like there's always a reason why, not like, you know, end of the world Maya calendar, but end of the world, like the water and the air and the war and the fires. So, uh, yes, I think your generations have seen that. And I think it's been to the detriment of who you are as individuals, because we know that in the future, we're all going to have to be more conscious of, you know, the energy that we use and how we get about and the kind of, if we have a business, it has to be, it, it has to be a more social business. But on the other hand, somehow in the middle of the crisis, I think you guys were robbed of the years where you just, you're just running around thinking, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be a vet. I'm going to be... Uh, cowboy and then you're probably going to have some weird midlife crisis at some point when you're going to go off and try to get a new trade and learn how to knit or something (laughs) yeah definitely (laughs) because Um, it it got deferred yeah Yeah, I I wonder if this like speaks again to like the individuality of the people in the US because uh, it's like putting your problems onto people that aren't you grants you way more freedom. Like you don't have to worry about that anymore because now it's someone else's job to like clean up after you. So in a way it's more like it's both trying to preach collective, like working for the benefit of all of humanity. And also at the same time, it's also talking to like looking out for yourself. So it's this weird contradiction that happens and um, like has been happening. Like my parents also remember their parents telling them the same thing. So (laughs) it's, it's just, it's kind of crazy to think about like this phenomena has just been going on throughout time and the problems just keep on getting worse and worse because no one addresses it. I mean, some people do. And those people are like crazy strong because there has to be a reason why people just push it off to the next people, like next generation. Yeah. Um, yeah, But but also 
jumping in stuff that have been, that I've been noticing lately, and one of them is I've always thought that the evil people. It's not that they're more, it's just that they have be better PR. And you turn on the TV and it's everywhere. The world is ending and everything is on fire. But um, the truth is, two things that I've been thinking. One, I think there was a time where we put everything on the younger generations. Or like, you're going to be do doing everything. I, and I remember especially just the unbelievable amount of faith on, in millennials when they were very young. It's like the millennials are coming to save us. And which is totally unfair to the millennials, right? Because they're just people. But what I'm noticing now is all their people changing. All their political leaders actually taking action and doing stuff. And, and it's like a broad spectrum, right? And then science quietly doing things like this week, almost, almost coming up with a vaccine against Alzheimer's. Imagine that. And I'm not... Crazy people, Calvin and I were talking about Elon Musk earlier, but it's not just crazy billionaires that plan to go to Mars. It's the quiet crowdfunding efforts that are finding close to uh, 11,000 exoplanets right now and new genome mapping techniques. So the truth is the quality of the air has improved from 100 years and the water is still a problem, but... Um, medicine has improved so we only see the crisis and i think that the crisis benefits some people this idea that it's hopeless that everything is awful that we're all gonna live awful we're gonna die awful deaths because of our sins uh, i think one thing that i learned about trump is oh my god who where if biden is the next president can we have four years of quiet and not knowing what the American president is thinking and just go back to being human? Right. And I I so agree with what, what you're saying. I guess it is that fact that evil things do have better PR and that's what we're mostly thinking about. So I think that's a really, really good segue to our next topic, which would be like, regardless of the result of the elections this year, which seem very charged with many feelings of impending doom. What are, oh my God. Yeah, I know. What are your thoughts regarding change that isn't made by policy, that it's, like you were saying, Jessica, made by individuals, by humans in their daily lives? Uh, well, I've been thinking before that, I'm going to have to add some change that is political, and but I think it's important mm -hmm. in the United States, and it's this. Um, be, because of a combination of international role play and, and spy and stuff that has to do with the Russians and, and the Arabs and all that, President Trump came in and he took over the Republican Party. And I think the Republican Party paid too much of a price in order to get their judges through by embracing the Trump craziness. However, stuff that you guys might want to keep an eye on is, for example, the, the Lincoln Project that is pro-diversity and is about the rights of uh, what is um, quote-unquote minorities. But the Lincoln Project that is opposing Donald Trump right now was founded by Republicans. And yeah. so, <laughs> right? Yeah, Calvin, do you want to say something about that? I've actually seen, so I'm on Twitter, and I've seen like people tweet out like this exact thing. And it's like, right now, their best interest is going against Trump. However, if Trump loses, you don't know what they're going to do. They may not be like a champion for like more social justice stuff. Well, so. they, but they're not going to be champions for uh, liberal causes. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is a lot of people are going down with the Trump ship because, you know, it's simply unexcusable. The things that they have supported in order just to get their judges. But other people have left. Other people are speaking. And there is another group that is Republicans for Biden. And it's the same thing. It's actually people that are organizing. And my point is, there's going to be Trumpism and we're going to have to live with Trumpism for some time. Win or lose, this, you know, this semi-fascist flags that they are flying in their rallies and, and this very angry militias already found a political voice and they found a role in the political stage. But on the other hand, the Republican Party it's not going to have to rethink itself. And it's good to have this other part in the conversation. I mean, I'm no Republican and I can't vote, 
but it's good that it's not only Trumpism. That's what I'm saying. I think there's only movements around. And there's leaders, there are political, and then now I'm going into the question. There's other courses of action. And I think one of the reasons why the United States had this freak out that affected everyone is that um, the change already happened. You cannot take all the black people back to Africa. You cannot take the Latinos out. You cannot send the women back to the kitchen. It's already here. And the freak out happened when people who are 60 and 70 turn, turned on the TV and the main character in Star Wars was a black man. And they went, how did this happen? And then they had the freak out. But this is one of the last freak outs they're gonna have because the society already changed. So yes, there's gonna be consequences to this, but the fact is that people are living their lives. And Lin Manuel Miranda is creating a version of Hamilton that has rap in it. And there's artists doing uh, communication among themselves. And my point is, it is not like Calvin was saying, I think you cannot just take the children and send them forth to clean up my mess. But I think that somehow, a lot of us have become political because we got so scared that we have to. And I think people are now just living their lives with more awareness and hopefully more kindness because the, we have seen what happens with lack of kindness. We have seen what happens when hate takes the wheel. And for some of us, it was scary enough that we're becoming more mindful in our lives. And I think this goes to all ages. And I've seen in the United States, political leaders that are old and on their way out, also making the shift. So I think for the first time we realize this is not passing it on to the children. Right. So um, to talk about uh, changes that like you can personally do, um, I think that like working uh, with like non-government, uh, like social justice <laughs> organizations are definitely like one of the better things that you can do just like by yourself, I guess, uh, just like joining some sort of community, which obviously don't do it unless it's safe <laughs> right now coming together and more of like in enacting change within like smaller areas or, um, like championing for better environmental, uh, like protections, uh, within your community. So, and like, there's uh, like one of the, so for a project for school, I was looking at uh, a certain project that was going on in Detroit where I live and what they're doing is just like cleaning up the Rouge River because they want to, um, which is the main river that goes uh, through Detroit. So it's things like that that you can do that will help the world for the future that don't necessarily have to do with politics, which um, I understand why uh, people want that right now, because it seems like the whole world is politics. Um, <laughs> so there's things like that that you can do. And then obviously, if you're not feeling comfortable enough with volunteering, I think educating yourself is also one of the best things that someone can do. Uh, just because there are so many issues right now, just making sure that you are educated on the matters that are important to today and will be important in the future is definitely one of the best things that a person can do for themselves just because you become more comfortable with the topics. You don't become as stressed out uh, because you don't understand what they're talking about or what is happening or why it's happening. So I think that that is a very good thing that an individual can do just for themselves. And also they can then provide input when they want to provide input uh, to that conversation. Yeah. And I also think that unplugging, you know, if the media has created and social media as well, this sense of hysteria and there's political reasons for that. I think like Calvin was saying, just like, educate yourself, but also do whatever you can. And if whatever you can is just be a happier person, then just try not to be angry at everything that you read because you don't know the reasons. Just use common sense and also use common sense when you deal with another human being. Not everything is divided into Antifa 
and the Boogaloo Boys. You know, most of humanity falls in the middle and most of humanity has their own stories. So just being mindful of others and being mindful that they might have a bad day and they're not racist, just hungry. You know, yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, I, I would like to clarify something. So Antifa, and this is definitely political, even though it wasn't until like a few months ago, Antifa is just like this general movement against fascism. So <laughs> Uh, it it's, isn't, yeah, it's, it's, it, it it's isn't not even extreme a thing. or uh, very like when you think about something that's against fascism, it doesn't sound very uh, progressive. It just sounds like something that happens, right? Something that you should be doing because most of the worst dictatorships in the world was were created through fascism. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> uh, it. it it's just wild to me that uh, Antifa is now something like related to like a radical <laughs> opinion. Yeah, but this was cons- <laughs> the whole concept of being anti fascist is now extremist in itself. Yeah. What the hell? I know. I know. Oh my goodness. It feels like a lot really has changed about the way we think and concepts that we that had a different meaning before have changed now that we all are so divided and it hold different opinions. And like we were talking about before now, even facts, we can choose to believe or not believe in them, which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it is the post to there. But however, can I say this? Yes. And I think this is where younger people come in, not necessarily you guys have to save us all. <laughs> but I think if we come collectively out of this last four years with a lesson is to be more selective and more careful in what we consume in terms of information. And, you know, like Calvin was saying, like be careful with the terms that you use and how you use them. And just that, and I'm saying this because yesterday I saw this article that said the internet is eating boomers brains. (laughs) And it's this whole thing that is happening in the United States where Uh, especially elderly women, but mostly boomers, are now in Facebook reading about QAnon and they're really thinking that Donald Trump is saving the planet from a network of pedophile Democrats. But it's basically because people, boomers saw the advent of the internet, like this weird technology that, that they never touched. And I know this because I belong to the generation that very fearfully sent their first email and they had no idea how the letter was going to get to the other side. So my parents look at the internet like their parents look at microwave ovens. And the problem is they consume it. They're online and they are voting and they are reading about QAnon and, and freaking out about what is happening because they really have no notion of literacy. And I can tell from years of teaching from the beginning of the millennials that were totally social media to your generation that is really a lot more careful about what they consume and how they represent themselves. I think digital literacy for older people is one of the things that needs to happen. I I completely agree, 100%. And I think it comes back to... Um, like Colin was saying, was saying about educating yourself, but also what you're saying, Jessica, which is making sure you know your sources, where you're getting your information, where how are you educating yourself, and then just yeah. finding that balance between um, being exposed to social media and the traditional media and all that's happening in the world, but also, um, you know, taking care of your yeah, own but, mental but, health. Yeah. But tell grandma, because I think <laughs> we are doing a better job than older people are doing yeah. and you know the people that I know that believe in QAnon are older than me and I'm old as dirt yep. and I don't <laughs> see young people coming in you know I see my old friends like yeah but did you know that uh, Barack Obama eats children and Donald Trump is undercover and I'm like well, what are you talking about and they saw this in YouTube and they went to the Google <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh Speaking from experience trying to teach older relatives how to use social media, it is definitely something that requires a lot of patience because, as you said, Jessica, it, it's 
yeah, they, they view it as like an even older generation would view a microwave. It, it's foreign. It's like, why, why does it work? How does it work? And what I've found, and like, I, I recommend doing this, like to, for the sake of humanity, um, <laughs> like that way your grandma doesn't post weird stuff on Twitter <laughs> because she thinks that she thinks that it's cool or it's a conspiracy theory, but she doesn't realize. Um, <laughs> so what, what I found is very effective is like going through with these people that aren't comfortable with it. And instead of like jumping right into the app that you're trying to teach them, it's first making sure that they understand the technology. It's like explaining to them what a motherboard is, right. what memory is, and like cameras and storage and all of that. Because if, and this just goes for like humans, how they learn, you can't really learn something and be comfortable with it unless you know how it works. And so a phone, like a smartphone, it's from the outside, it just looks like this thing, like a brick, has a few cameras and like glass, right? It's this weird thing. And if someone who doesn't know what technology is just looked at it, they'd be like, they'd just be so confused and yeah. why does it work? And I think that most people understand like what motherboards are and all that, but explaining like a little more in detail on how it works in phones definitely has been proven more successful with me. And then relating that to like how an app works uh, specifically, like what parts of the phone does it use? Cause then you become more comfortable with it and you're less afraid of like exploring into the settings and exploring into different parts of your phone. Cause like my, grandpa he still has a flip phone because he's and he's still like even scared like changing the volume because he doesn't want to like accidentally delete everything change the settings yeah yeah so it's it's something that takes a ton of patience and if you don't have a ton of patience find someone who does <laughs> uh, <laughs> Try it. yeah because it's very easy to get upset when you're trying to teach something like this because for someone from my generation, Generation Z, we grew up with this, right? We understand it so well. So yeah. trying to under trying to explain something that you get just by like intuition is one of the hardest things that someone can do with patience. And imagine this: I literally got an email from a Nigerian prince, and I went <laughs> like, "Is this real? Why is he writing me?" Because it was new at the time, and it was email. And so, yeah, imagine just the immense conceptual jump. And adding to what you were saying, Calvin, about understanding the technology, it's understanding the concept of the technology. For boomers, and even for my generation, Generation X, um, if you read something in the newspaper, it must be true because the people who prepare the newspaper are editors and journalists, and they've been in the business for 50 years, and it's kind of trustworthy. Of course, there's always like, you know, the alarmist rag. But mostly, if it's in the news, it must be true. And the idea that the internet is a collective construction, that anyone can mean. Well, the best example is my dad simply cannot understand how this video of Dogface, you know, grooving to Fleetwood Mac on his <laughs> skateboard is a thing. He says, I don't get it. And I'm like, but it's so cool. He's so happy. And he's like, so what? What is the point? So... The notion of how who uses the channel and what they're trying to communicate will forever go over, he said. Right. And to that same point, just like being aware that the people that are writing on the other side of the screen aren't necessarily educated as well as they should be on the topics that they're writing about. Mm -hmm. So that's always something that, like, even I need to remind myself that. And as I said, this is just like a part of my brain at this point. And I still catch myself, like, just, like, believing whatever I read, even though it's some random person from, like, Idaho, just, like, <laughs> in their basement, just, like, typing because they had a thought, right? It's not backed up by any previous study, so... Yeah, but we're wired to read it. If it's on the screen, we, we're kind of wired to think someone published this, therefore it must be true. Yeah, and this, yes, it, it, we need to... Um, 
remind ourselves every single day with every single tweet and post that it's not so. Yes, definitely. And I think it comes to show the importance of technology and the internet in this year's election. And then also, I think it's nice. It's um, one of those aspects of, you know, human kindness of the younger generations showing the older generations how to properly use these technologies. Because at the end of the day, it's for everybody's benefit that our grandparents are correctly informed because they're also voters that will um, make decisions for us for years to come. So I really am so glad you both mentioned that because it's a crucial part of the election this year. And then um, just to close up, I just wanted to ask you both if you had any final thoughts about the election on Tuesday or anything in general. Calvin, you start. I'm still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So on Tuesday, I both my parents are working the polls. So I'm going to have like, I'm kind of nervous, right? Because uh, there's already been instances of like protesters, uh, uh, supporters of either sides, like kind of just like rallying around like polling stations because early voting is happening right now. So, and like, there's been some instances of uh, like violence up, coming up so if that's happening before election day like before precincts are reporting in their numbers and all of that i have like this kind of fear that something really bad might happen and so a little context for this i live in michigan the governor of michigan uh recently uh was threatened to be kidnapped by uh like a militia group and the fbi like arrested all of them or something i don't know <laughs> Uh, but it's been taken care of by the FBI, which I think is the main point. Um, however, uh, however, the knowing... Supreme Court has not forbidden the use of open carry, the open carry um, at the yeah. polls. Right. Yeah. So, like things like that that are happening, just it's giving me kind of like uh, nervous feelings about Tuesday, because. I think that just because my parents are going to be like there all day counting late into the night, it's giving me like even more worry. And for elections before, I didn't have that. And like the U.S. has mostly been a nation where you didn't have to worry about safety when you're going to vote. Like in and now just like having that kind of notion, it's just this brand new thing to me especially since I've only been politically aware like this for the past, like what? So I've only had like what three elections that have been politically aware, but in those past three, it, it's never been like this. So it's going to be very interesting what happens depending on which candidate wins and the aftermath. Yeah. I, I guess, I guess those will be my last thoughts. Just like, pay attention to what happens after the election because if trump loses he'll still have until january to enact whatever he wants so and that makes me so angry because if he loses he's gonna pardon himself and everybody <laughs> else and i'm already angry i'm like what do i care but i'm still like Dah! And along those lines, I've uh, spoken to uh, former students who are now friends and they're in the States and they're concerned for their own safety. And uh, they're concerned that if there's going to be fighting. And I think it's really an important day because if, he, if, he, if Biden wins clearly enough that there's no contest in the election, then perfect. There's still going to be you know, a movement and there's going to be problems, but it's going to be manageable. If Trump actually does what he's threatening to do, which is use the court to give himself the election, I really don't know what's going to happen. And I fear that the uncertainty is going to be harmful for the whole Western world, because this thing has been harmful for the whole Western world. And if Trump wins, then that's going to be horrible for your country and mine. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's bad because I've seen what's happening here and we're so much more vulnerable in any sense than the United States. And we're so dependent on even the state of mind. So my personal feelings to this is I hope and I pray that Biden wins by a comfortable margin because then the fallout 
will remain within the United States. And then the United States will have to go to the corner and sit down and think about what they've done. If anything else happens, it's going to be very bad for days, for uh, uh, four years, for the rest of us. So I'm trying to disconnect from social media and not do doom scrolling. I am failing. And I, then I watch Stephen Colbert and I watch Seth Meyers and then I laugh, but I also get angry. And a part of me is like, it doesn't concern me. And a part of me is, of course, it concerns me because I see it on the streets of my country. So I kind of came to terms that the United States is this big orange blob that is in my horizon, and it makes no point trying to ignore it. Now I'm trying to manage my personal reaction to it, which is very hard because yesterday some politician here did something stupid and I'm still reeling from it. And, uh, but it's the first time in many years, that I'm, in many days, that I'm not blaming Trump. So that's good, I guess. Now I'm coming <laughs> back to my reality. And so I guess mental cleanliness and health. And I hope, Calvin, that your parents stay safe and take care of themselves. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. And I appreciate you both um, coming here and talking about this very difficult subject because it is so heavy and it, it takes such a toll on on our health. Like you were both saying, it's 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 not only like our mental health, but now it's also worrying about our safety. So I really do appreciate you both taking the time to come here and share your thoughts. I feel like I learned so, so much. So I'm so grateful for you both. So thank you so much. Here. Here. I learned a lot. Thank you for having us. And uh, I think the space was necessary. So thank you all. Thank you so much for listening to our Going Global podcast. If you have any ideas for any upcoming episodes, make sure to DM our Instagram at LIU Global. Thank you so much again and see you next time.